This is episode number 67 featuring artist John McDonald. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast from Plein Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. In the Plein Air Podcast, we dive into the world of outdoor painting called Plein Air Painting. For those who don't know, it's a French term meaning in the open air or outdoors. The French say Plein Air, others say Plain Air. But no matter how you say it, it's a huge movement of artists around the world going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. This podcast is sponsored by the African Painting Safari. Ooh, it's a bucket list trip. A chance to go on safari, stay in beautiful luxury accommodations, explore Africa, plus plein air painting together. The tour operator has designed a special trip allowing for special time to paint, and you'll come home with a unique collection of African paintings. We'll paint the amazing scenery and animals of Africa, and yes, we will be in safe places to paint where you can see the animals, but they're not going to be a problem for you. Plus, we'll paint in the amazing Victoria Falls, one of the great wonders of the world. And it's going to make for some great paintings. Imagine what those are going to look like. Uh, it kind of makes Niagara Falls look like a small stream. Well, uh, this is a small and exclusive group, and you can bring your spouse or your partner, and it's going to be a blast. You will proudly be telling stories about painting in Africa for the rest of of your life. Visit AfricanPaintingSafari.com. You know, it's my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting, and you can help by sharing this podcast with your friends on social media, and we hope you'll subscribe and leave a comment when you go to iTunes. If you have feedback, reach me by sending a note, eric at plenairmagazine.com. The interview is brought to you by the Plen Air Convention, which is going to be in Santa Fe, New Mexico this coming April. Last year, we had close to a 1,000 people. We had a blast. It was so much fun. A lot of people showed up who had never painted before or never plein air painted before, and everybody left with increased painting skills because we have basically a week of over 70 top master artists teaching and working with you, painting daily, all of us together in the beautiful scenery around San Santa Fe. I started to say San Jose. That wouldn't have worked. Uh, anyway, painting around San, Santa Fe. And you can learn more about this convention, plenairconvention.com. Well, let's get right to our interview with the amazing John McDonald. Today, I am absolutely thrilled to have John McDonald on with us. John, welcome to the Plen Air Podcast. Hello, Eric. Glad to be here. You are uh, emanating from where? You're in Western Massachusetts, Williamstown, Massachusetts, in my uh, tiny but warm and cozy studio. <laughs> well, I've been to your tiny but warm studio. It's a beautiful studio. We did a little video together, I don't know, maybe a, a summer or two ago. Yeah, I think it was just last, uh, maybe July, I think it was. July, August, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think what actually did it is that um, I, I walked in your studio and I saw something that you were doing that was kind of unique. And that kind of led me to saying we ought to do a video together because you were doing something on your computer screen that had to do with uh, values and then you were using that for your underpainting. You want to talk about that concept? Yes, it's, it's you know, it's something that I, that I started using because it really came out of the need to do larger studio paintings. Um, and ideally, I would go out into the field, uh, take photos, yes, do a sketch, and if possible, if I had the time, do a plein air study. Sometimes I simply didn't have that. But what I learned from plein air painting, and which is why I'm such a, a huge advocate of every landscape painter spe scheduling time for plein air painting, is you quickly learn what the camera cannot capture and what it can. It's not bad in capturing values. It's terrible in capturing color, which is why a plein air study can be wonderful, even if you plan on doing the finished painting at a different scale in the studio. Um, but what I ended up doing as I was working with photographs is, as I had spent 15 years almost as solely as a freelance illustrator, um, and I was working in a medium called scratchboard, black and white, that I would create at the drawing table, 
but quickly realized that, that being able to color it digitally would save me enormous amounts of time and work. So I became somewhat proficient in Photoshop. It is a, it is a huge program with an enormously steep learning curve, but I learned just those things that I needed to learn in order to color a black and white image. Well, uh, what I started to realize in Photoshop is it is it is really an image editing program, not an image creating. And I picked up some skills that allowed me to manipulate photographs. So I could change the values of photographs, create color shifts. And I realized it would, for better or worse, be a good tool for when I was reviewing photographs I had taken on location to create a painting, a large painting in the studio. So I, I spend a fair amount of time now in Photoshop. In the old days, I would have has say printed a photograph out and then with tracing paper cropped it in different ways maybe i would pull out a sketchbook and do 20 little thumbnails and then blow some of those up a lot of the time now i do all of that in photoshop um same process requiring the same skills photoshop doesn't do the work for me but it does allow me to go through many more ideas and to manipulate a photograph just to see if hey what happens if i do light in the sky or dark in the sky one of the reasons I like Photoshop, though, primarily is because being out in the field, I come back, I download my photos, I try to edit those photos immediately as soon as I get back into the studio so I can change the photo as to how I remembered it on location, um, which I think is if, if I find that if I wait two or three days, I tend to forget what it looked like. Uh, was the sky that pink that it shows up in the photograph? Well, if I have a clear memory of what it was like, I can at least in a way reconstruct the scene on my computer as as I remembered it on location, something a camera can't do. So typically, I, ideally, when I start to work on a large canvas in the studio, um, I'll have uh, on my large monitor a, the full, a full color photograph that I have manipulated in Photoshop to recreate kind of how I remembered it. And then next to me, a plein air study uh, for, the, for really color, mostly for color information. But playing around in Photoshop and mostly manipulating the values and converting a photo to black and white, it reminded me of the very traditional step in the painting process in the 19th century and into the 20th century, that, that, that step of creating an underpainting. So I, I quickly re realized that, that uh, the Photoshop, by manipulating the values, converting it to black and white, and then next to the photograph, I would I have created a value scale of 10 value steps, and I've pasted that in Photoshop on my monitor in the on next to the photograph. It allows me to take very specific sections of the photo and identify where they are on a value scale. All information that I felt that would be very helpful to have, especially when I was going to do a monochromatic underpainting. So there's a lot of uh, head work, you know, analysis that goes into at least the large paintings that I do, identifying certain value ranges, and then trying to, to match those values in the underpainting. Um, I found, though, that it, that far from stifling the creative process, it, it actually is, is very freeing because my success rate soared. I was just creating fewer failures. Of, and for doing large paintings, when I'm spending four to 10 painting sessions, which would represent 10 to 40 hours on a large painting, I want that painting to succeed. Um, I, I certainly don't want to put 30 hours into a painting only to discover that the value structure isn't working or that the composition is weak. Um, those are problems that I now in, uh, absolutely insist to myself that I solve at the very beginning stages in the photograph or in the underpainting. So you're taking, you're taking technology and using it to your benefit. The purist might be a little bit offended by that. So how do you address the purist who say, well, you should only go off of your, your plein air study to do a, a studio piece, uh, uh, yeah, how how do you how do you deal with that? Well, two things. One, they're right if the technology is a crutch. If if that's all you're doing is is using the technology to to dictate the end product of the painting, uh, which is why I paint plein air as often as I can. But but I'll, I'll say this. I mean, we are artists and we make paintings. We don't make document documentaries documentaries. Of, of what we're seeing. So I don't see any difference between 
painting and copying a photograph and just copying what I'm seeing on location. If I'm copying, it doesn't matter what I'm looking at, a photograph or location. Sure, on location, the color information will be richer, but if the whole point is just to copy, I don't see the point in that. We're artists, we make paintings, we interpret these things. Uh, and I think as much interpretation can go into a, a photograph as it can to see a scene on location. I've never, in all the years I painted Plan Air, I have probably never seen one scene that I didn't have to edit some information. Um, and that the same is true of a photograph. So I would agree with them if the technology, if working from photos is just a crutch. But I do think that it can be very helpful if 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 you meld that with a, a extensive periods of plein air painting. Um, so you know what you're looking at when you see a look at a photograph. You know what it can capture and what it can't. But I think I think as the years go by for me, more and more the bottom line is I'm a painter. I'm not a reporter. I'm not trying to record facts. I'm not trying to record just what I see. And I see in my own work that some of my weakest paintings are when I go out on plein air and try to copy just what I see rather than making a painting. It's I, an interpretation. Yeah, yeah I, I was out painting and a woman walked up to me and she says, oh, it looks just like a photograph. And I know she meant well, <laughs> but I, yes, I, was, yes, right. I was a little bit offended, but I didn't, of course, didn't show that. Um, talk to me about the, the art aspect. Uh, you've got a lot of people who are listening to this who are fairly novice, a lot of new painters. You've also got uh, highly experienced painters, but the novice painters uh, are you know, oftentimes kind of stuck in that copying mode. So how do you define what makes something art? How do you, you know, what makes it feel artistic? What gives it that sense of um, aliveness or emotion or something that differentiates from just copying? Well, that's 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 such a good question, um, and and I think hard to answer because I think each artist we come to our own answers to that question. So, may not apply to other artists. Um, you know, what is what is the what is the subject of a painting? Uh, I think that having a, a good technique is extremely important, and I think for beginners, and and I and don't you know I don't want it to be misunderstood. I think that going out painting plein air or from frankly a photograph and trying to copy exactly what you see is great training. Um, it's a great way to learn to see color, to mix it, uh, to, to learn the limitations of your palette, the paints, the pigments you've chosen. Um, but, but, but that's not the end all. It's not why we become painters just to copy, but there is a place for that. Uh, there is a place. In fact, this afternoon, the plein air painter I did behind my painting, I did behind my studio. Um, I, I really was trying to capture exactly some of the colors I was seeing in the background. Um, I think that the more proficient you become, the more experienced you become, you know when you you know when copying what you see is will lead to a good painting and when it will not. And I can't define that. It's something that I think as you get more experience, you will know when it will work and you'll be able to see it in others. Um, in terms of in terms of you know what makes it art, what doesn't, I, I think the older I've gotten to the the broader, the definition of art I'm willing to entertain. Even, you know, Thomas Kincaid, who am I to knock, you know, those criticize those people who are profoundly moved by his paintings. Isn't that one thing that art can do is move people? Um, I think that the only art that I would, would, uh, would criticize would be what I would consider inauthentic art. Art that is, um, you know, maybe based on gimmicks or or is is dishonest, not authentic. If it's coming from your soul, coming from your heart, your mind, all your skills, it's going to be authentic art, whether it looks like Grandma Moses or Vincent Van Gogh or Albert Beardstadt. Um, I, well, I think that well, that kind of authenticity is crucial. We all go through a path. We all go through this period where what we like in the beginning may change over time. What was that for you? It, it, did do you still have? Are you still drawn to the same kind of paintings you were when you first started painting, or have you, you know, evolved into different ways? 
Well, you know, it's funny. It's funny you mention that because because I'm not teaching this year, taking time off from teaching. I've been doing a lot of thinking about where my painting wants to go. And I think turning 60 did that, too. You know, I'm seeing my own mortality. And, and in the back of my mind is this realization that I'm running out of time um, and, and I'm not as good as I want to be. Um, but but in terms of the growth, it's strange because I found myself when I was in my 20s, I was a realist, born and bred realist, and was attracted very much to the Hudson River School. And yet looking back, my two favorite painters were probably George Ennis and Gustav Klimt. And if I look around my studio, I still to this day see those that influence in the paintings I'm doing today. I, I recently, the last, oh, I guess, uh, maybe six months or so, I've been doing a lot of paintings in the woods behind my house, and I'm just attracted to the abstract qualities of the scene, mostly the these vertical tree trunks separated by these horizontal lines that you see of the forest floor that could be sunlight capturing it, or now there are these beautiful layers of snow. Um, and I'm realizing that's right out of Gustav Klimt. I, uh, so I think in some ways, in some ways, and it's, it's I don't know, I don't want to sound maudlin or cliche, you know, make this a cliche, but in some ways, I think we spend our whole lives not doing different things so much as we we end up clarifying what we wanted to do from the very beginning. Um, and I think that I fell in love with certain qualities of a George Ennis and a, and a Gustav Klimt's paintings, and I'm still, you know, that's still part of the mixture of what I work on and what I want to learn both technically and my subject matter and the feelings I might want to evoke in a painting. And I, I keep going back again and again to sometimes the same subject matter. Um, not that I, I don't break out. I, I, there's a part of me that loves seascapes, which has, you know, having grown up in Indi the state of Indiana, we're, we're a, few, a few miles from the ocean in any direction. And uh, I, I, late in life, have kind of fallen in love with the, the qualities, the vocabulary of a, of a seascape, very different. Um, I, I think that the older I get, it, in some ways things become clearer, but then sometimes the clearer they become, the more I feel these opposite pulls to go <laughs> different directions. So, so uh, just for clarity purposes, uh, a, a lot of people, when they think of Klimt, they think of the kiss and they think of these these glitzy robes. But most people don't realize that Glimt was a fabulous landscape painter. He was. He did very few of them. I think 14 or 16, not many more than that. And, oh, and he, they really rock. Oh, and he was quoted as saying at, at the end of his towards the end of his life, he was quoted as saying, if you really want to know who I am as an artist, look at my landscapes. Um, yeah, his the kiss, his his portraits, his portraits are stunning and his ability to incorporate pattern um, and a graphic quality of the work, and yet it still re manipulates space is incredible. But he has one painting called The Swamp, uh, which is, which is I think, one of the finest, to the, still to the, one of the finest landscapes I've ever seen. It just does it all. And I'm still in awe, you know, as I study it more and more. Um, so, yes, he was a terrific landscape painter, as was George Ennis. And very different qualities, very different qualities as painters and as people, and technically very different but each each was just so authentic in doing their own thing and insisting that they paint the way they want to paint, regardless of the market, regardless of categories. Well, Ennis, uh, Ennis kind of changed his tune uh, later in his life. He changed considerably. He frequently changed. He was always experimenting with techniques, um, uh, different techniques, different approaches to the landscape, being influenced by, uh, I forget the names, having, having read read uh, Church's big, thick book about Ennis. But yeah, he, 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 he changed quite a bit through his life. Um, and, and I find his, I still believe his greatest work was his last work when he became more and more abstract. He did a tremendous amount of plein air painting when he was, when he was older. And I think by older, I mean, you know, maybe in his 50s on. I don't think he did an awful lot of painting on location. He had incorporated and, and learned so much from all of that plein air painting that he was just inventing paintings by that time. His his visual vocabulary was so broad, he could tell a story without re having to refer to the dictionary of, of plein air painting. Did, he just invented did, things. Did, did you ever <laughs> see uh, Blakelock paintings? Yes, yes, I have. So Ennis's the end of Ennis's career reminds me of Blakelock. I don't know who came first, but um, you know, there's kind of a similar quality in in some parts of it. Blakelock probably pushed the limits even more. Um, 
but I, you know, your work kind of reminds me of a, a kind of a Blake Locke Ennis tonalist. Um, you know, it's but I, I think yours is I, I don't know I don't know how to describe it. How would you describe your work? I, to the tonalism certainly is is there, and, and I think that the aspect of their works that I respond to so much and identify with is um, the, the, the their subjects are moods, their subjects are emotions, their subject is the the response to the landscape less than what it looks like, perhaps. Um, and I and I think that that's I, I think for me a painting is an emotional experience. It's, it, even though a lot of thinking goes into the especially the beginning stages, um, I like I I like to create in an emotion, a mood, a, a, a sense of atmosphere, a sense of light, um, rather than being a narrative painter. And I and I don't knock those. There are some great narrative painters. Norman Rockwell, you know, he tells a story with his paintings, and and that's a different kind of painting. It's not better nor worse. Then there are the 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 virtuosic paintings of the Richard Schmidt or the Sargent, where part of that subject matter is very much how well it's painted. Just their beautiful and incredible talent with the brush stroke. Um, I can admire it. I wish I could, you know, paint like that, but it, it isn't it isn't me. So I, yeah, I would throw myself into the tonalist camp, looking more for mood, for feeling, and where technique, rather than being maybe the primary focus of some of the paintings, how I paint, it's it still is what I paint. Um, but it, but again, it's it's you know that's that's my, maybe my seascapes. I'm getting a little bit of a you know trying to get a certain mood in them. But sometimes the, the a seascape or some of these wood scenes, I'm interested in the graphic quality of it. So then it's then it's even it's not so much a technique. It's not so much a story. It's just all about the abstract graphic quality of, of shapes and how they interrelate inter interrelate and how they affect the painting. So. There's just a, there's a lot to do. <laughs> there's a lot to learn, uh, and an un, an unbelievably huge world to explore in this thing we call painting. So you uh, you mentioned that you're not going to do workshops this year um, because you're you're going to stop teaching. What was the driving factor behind that? Well, I, I, I guess I'm fortunate in that at least I have enough painting sales that I don't depend on income to teach. Uh, I don't depend on, I'm sorry, I don't depend on teaching for any income. I, I do it for the love of it. Um, but last year I, I, I did seven multi-day workshops, two demos, and it just took too much time away from, from the easel. I'm finding that I feel rusty if I don't paint for two days. So a workshop, I may not, I may not touch a brush other than doing some demos during a workshop. I may not do some serious painting for five or six days. And, and I've, I found that that was affecting, I thought, the quality of my work. So I thought I would take a semester or a semester, a sabbatical, a, a, a year off, um, kind of recharge my batteries, think about how I wanted to structure future workshops, and then just set some goals for me uh, as a painter, um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to be doing I've already arranged two one week periods to be on the coast of Maine to paint. I'll be up in the Adirondacks with your great group again up at Paul Smith's, which I look forward to in June. Um, so I, one of my one of my most important goals was to really seriously get back to, to plein air painting and maybe start to do larger works outdoors uh, over multiple sessions. Um, and that's been very interesting. We, we've had a cold, we had a very cold December, but January has been fairly mild. I've been able to get out almost every day, every other day. And I've probably in the, since the start of the year, um, maybe, I don't know, 20, 20 little nine by 12 plein air paintings. And it's been both a revelation, but also a, a good little, a good beating for the ego to go back and into that kind of plein air. I, I, I've been reminded by this kind of an intense period of plein air painting in the last four weeks, um, that I why I don't consider myself a plein air painter uh, because it's really the the my most natural way process of painting is thin layers slowly over multiple painting sessions and that works beautifully in the studio, uh, but it really does not work well as a plein air painter it, and plein air painting requires just a much more direct and quick looking, seeing, and painting. And, and I'm hoping it's, you know, it's pushed, this is pushing me out of my comfort zone, which is what I wanted. So I'm hoping a, a, a full year of just intense plein air painting will not only, will I be 
find and let evolve a natural style that fits me for plein air painting, but I have no question that it will improve the quality of my studio painting. So it's going to be an exciting year. Um, I'm going to, you know, going out of my comfort zone, I'm going to go through a lot of periods of frustration that I haven't been experiencing in the studio, and that's good for me. So you and I met at the Adirondacks. I was not familiar with you at the time and uh, discovered that you were one of the great painters of the East. And so it's been such a pleasure to watch you and watch your, your career and watch your painting. Um, one of the, the great things I discovered about you is that you're a fabulous teacher. Um, not all painters are great teachers. Talk to me about what makes a good teacher when you're painting. Oh, you know, I, I, good, that's a good question. And, and, and honestly, I, I don't know if anyone's ever asked me that. I think I, I, I would say, especially in conversations with my wife, uh, that I've talked a lot about teaching. And um, I think that the two qualities that, that, that I guess I have, that people have told me I have, that I think helps me um, teach is, is, one is passion. I just, I do love this. Um, I, and and I, I love painting and I, and I love having reached the level of skill where I am now. Not that I don't have a long way to go, but it feels very good at the age of 60 to be doing things that at the age of 30, I had only dreamed I'd be able to do, but it was a lot of hard work. And I think because I love what I do and I see, I see now how I learned to get here. I really don't, I, I, I want to help people not have to spend 30 years getting where I am now. I wish I could get them there in a five day workshop. That's impossible. But at least if I can shave off five years of struggle and just try to, to clearly explain to them as much as I can, what makes for good painting. And here's a process of how you can create good paintings. Um, then that's what's meaningful to me to help help people. The other thing is, is I, 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 I it, strangely enough, when I got out of grad school and really started painting, um, I just spent my time studying the old masters. And sadly, I really neglected a lot of contemporary painters. I was pretty much a loner, very much an introvert, and I still am. Um, but I, I just learned on my own and, and which cost me a lot of time and effort. And had I reached out to fellow painters, I think I would have made much greater progress much more quickly, but I didn't. Um, so had I reached out to other painters, I think I would have made much greater progress. But now having gone through that kind of, I don't want to say I was self-taught. I was a fine arts major and I've studied books and I've read things and I've looked at videos. But I've thought an awful lot about this. I've thought a lot about what makes a good painting and what what hurts a painting. Um, so I, I feel that I know the material fairly well and coupled with just a desire to help people and a, and a love for it, I think that's what, what really makes for a good painter. Um, I, I think you have to connect with the people. You have to connect with, I, I, I don't wanna say students because a lot of my students, many of them are older than I am and many of them are very good painters. Um, but you just have to connect with people and find and, and see where they are and, and try to identify where they're struggling. And but also admit that sometimes you just don't know. I, I do feel that my strength is value, that I've spent most of much of my artistic career trying to understand values, value relationships, values, relationship to color. I feel like I'm still very much learning about color. Color continually surprises me. Um, I've got a ways to go on color, so that's maybe a weakness of mine. But uh, I think just knowing your weaknesses, in strangely enough, becomes your strength too. You need to know what you need to work on. Well, I, I, I think there's been a pride for a lot of people of being quote unquote self-taught. And, and I, I just think that what you said earlier is so important is that you know by attending a workshop um, they could shave five years off of, of, of trying to figure something out on their own, and you burned a lot of time. You know, this time to be alive is such a great time because we have these, all these tools. You know, we have workshops. I was talking to somebody earlier today, and they were talking about how, you know, when they were uh, trying to learn to paint, there weren't any workshops to go to. And now there's, you know, there's, there's, the market is flooded with great workshops, and we have you just did this this video, which I, I just think if somebody were to to paint alongside of it, not just you know maybe watch it once and then watch it and paint along and start and stop and kind of work on your painting, I mean and, and do that even a couple of times. I mean that's going to shave another five years off of it because now you're doing it, you're working on it. So 
And the fact that you're not teaching this year is, a, is probably a good reason to do that. But, you know, there's so many sources. You're going to be on stage at the plein air convention. And uh, yes. what yeah. are you going to do anyway? Do you have any idea? Yeah, I, I think because of the time limitation, I, I'm going to I'm going to demonstrate an underpainting. And I think what I'd like to do is is do, do a large one, uh, you know, maybe 24. Well, for me, large 24 by 36 or something um, to show both the techniques, but then really address why why I think an underpainting even if you don't use them, ultimately, I think doing some of them, going through a period in which you create underpaintings will teach you more about value than anything else. Value and the value structure of the painting and the, how to compose a painting, the composition. Um, it's, not, it's, it's a great teaching tool. So I thought that, that given the time limitation and this being my first time there, I thought I'd start simple. It's a game changer. It was a game changer for me. When I came to your studio and saw what you were doing with underpainting, and then I went and studied with Joe McGurl. Both of you doing an underpainting. McGurl does it on location. You don't. But right. uh, what a game changer in terms of the, the enriched quality of a studio painting. It really yes. changes everything. Well, if you, if you think about it, the most important parts of a painting are the composition and the value structure. Those are established. Whether you do a good job or a poor job, you're creating those at the very beginning of the painting. So, so be, even being on location, just taking the time to, to do an underpainting is taking time to focus on the composition and the value structure. And instead, what do we all do when we go out there? And I still struggle with this. I, I, I see a scene and what attracts me? A color relationship. A color relationship in the sunset or the water. And I want to get to that as soon as I can. And I skip through then the most important stages, composing, establishing the value structure, just to get to color. So yeah, on, on location, um, I used to, I went through a period of a couple years where I did underpaintings on location, every plein air painting, and I would do it in acrylic, and then I would let that dry and then go on top of it in oils. That's what I do. So yeah, and it's a great way. It's terrific. It was one of the best things I ever did for myself. I still might do that occasionally if, I, if I'm if i confused by the value structure. If I get out on, a, on location and I see a scene I'd like to paint, but I'm having trouble breaking down the, the, the basic values of it, uh, I find an underpainting works, or just grabbing a sketchbook and doing a tonal sketch helps a lot. But taking time to do that is critical. It really is. John, one of the things I find remarkable is the tonal quality of your paintings because uh, it's so tempting. You're standing out there and the sun is splashing that grass and that grass is reading as this brilliant, you know, chartreuse green and, and the colors, they just seem to be so vibrant and yet when you try to put those kind of colors down oftentimes it just feels too garish um, yes. how yeah. do you how do you get there where you've gotten to this point where your colors feel right they look natural but they also feel very tonal um, you know just technically in terms of uh, in terms of I think bringing your your colors 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 that are if you're if you're working with multiple pigments on your palette if you're if you have 16 20, colors on your palette and you're working at each color full volume, that means fully saturated, I think it's very hard to pull a painting together and have it work in terms of color. Um, there are a couple ways, I think, to create a color harmony and, and the, I, I don't want to, I don't want to imply though that muted color is the only way to use color and, and it's not. Um, saturated color can, can work beautifully as long as, as there's color harmony. And I've often been so, uh, so surprised looking at George Ennis at some of his paintings in our local Clark Museum. They have a wonderful collection of eight beautiful George Ennis paintings at how saturated his paintings can look when in reality they're really not. That's just understanding how to create color luminosity, keeping the values of two colors close and playing warm against cool. And it will make those colors look richer than they really are. But you're right, Eric, the temptation to see sun on grass and reach for a thalo green and throw in cad yellow light is almost overwhelming because that's how it looks. Um, another the, a way the tonalists, I think, often would create color harmony and keep the colors from being too garish would be to simply add one color to all of the piles, 
Whistler added black to almost every color he mixed. He would add a little bit of black. Um, that's a common way you can add. You could add an ultramarine blue. You can add a, a burnt umber, a burnt sienna. It will, of course, tend to skew the temperatures of the colors around, around the gamut of palette, um, which is fine, but it does tend to create color harmony. Uh, I, I think that, that as I, what I'm finding as I especially work with the warm key painting more and more that in, even in my limited palette, I will never touch a Prussian blue to mix all my greens. I will mix all of my greens with raw umber, white, and, and the yellow. Um, and I'm finding that the colors look, some, some of them look like a rich bluish green, a, a rich olive green, and I'm realizing more and more that that's what Ennis was doing. Um, I, the temptation, and I think that's part of learning color, is how subtle and sophisticated it can be as colors, you, you understand color relationship is the key to everything. So your mind sees a green and you think green, well, therefore that has means blue and yellow. Well, not necessarily. You can make it look green depending on what it's surrounded by. And that green you mix may be, may be yellow with the raw umber. It may be yellow with a purple. It may be yellow with a black. Um, if you mix a, a, a yellow ochre with a lamp black, you get a beautiful greenish, muted greenish tone that, that I used to see in the landscapes in the autumn here when grasses would get burned out. And it took me years to realize that that was the way to get that color. Well, again, I'm not mixing yellow and blue, I'm mixing yellow with black. So um, it's just a, a lot of it is just painting. We really learn to paint by painting and trying different palettes, trying different colors. Uh, but the tonalists, how do they create their tone? They tended to either work in a very limited palette or add one color to all of their colors to, to, to tie it together. And they also use glazes extensively where they would put, put a, warm, uh, a warm glaze of a red across an entire painting to tie those colors together. So for the person who doesn't know what the heck a glaze is, would you explain that, please? <laughs> yeah, a glaze is using a transparent media, usually consisting of some oils. It's, it's not dissimilar from a varnish. Uh, thin, transparent, say a linseed oil. Um, I use wax in, in my medium, so it can be used as a glaze. And then you would take preferably a, trans, a, a pigment that's translucent. Most of the earth tones, such as an umber, is, is fairly opaque. Uh, the cadmiums are opaque. But a, say an alizarin crimson, uh, ultramarine blue, Prussian blue, some of the translucent colors uh, work beautifully as glaze mediums. So I would simply coat the entire painting with, with this uh, medium, with a, with a, it's almost essentially a retouch varnish. And then with a the rag, mix some of the color in it. You can use a brush. Traditionally, I think they used a pounce brush to get a very consistent glaze. I tend to be a much more sloppy with my glazes, but it's just mixing a, a, tra a, tra a translucent, transparent medium, such as a, a, a retouch varnish, um, uh, with uh, with a translucent pigment, and it creates a wash. It's almost like a watercolor wash of one color across the entire painting, or certain certain areas. Sometimes, if I if I'm doing a winter scene, I'll put a blue glaze across the the foreground snow, and then as it works its way up into the trees, that blue will shift into a purple, and then maybe shift into a magenta by the time it gets into a sky. So I'm creating a gradient going through three colors in a single glaze. Um, it's 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 a very effective way of creating some color harmony and creating certain effects in a painting and a color richness that you can't get just using opaque paints on a paintbrush. What are the colors on your palette? Um, I use a the a white is a mixture of zinc and titanium. The zinc is slightly translucent. Titanium is more opaque. Uh, but you should an artist should never use pure zinc. It dries very brittle and it will crack. Um, so I use a 50-50 mixture, zinc, titanium, white. Um, I currently am using up the last of my cadmium yellow light. Uh, soon when that's gone, because I want to get rid of any toxic pigments, I'll be using a mixture of Windsor and Newton Hansa yellow and um, a, a Windsor Newton Indian yellow. If, if someone's really interested in that, please just visit my website, drop me an email, and I'll, I'll send you more information about that. I'm a huge advocate of having a non-toxic studio. But white 50-50, cadmium yellow light, or, or it's this imitation that I've I'm, I'm been mixing, um, Prussian blue, uh, permanent alizarin crimson, and raw umber. 
uh, oh, I'm sorry, and dioxazine purple. I don't really need the dioxazine purple because you can get get the exact same, the exact equivalent with the permanent alizarin crimson and Prussian. But I mix it so often um, that I just decided to just add it to my palate as a time saver. I think people will find that if they try a limited palette, they'll just be amazed at the co the color harmony that just kind of naturally occurs. Yes, it's a, it is astonishing. And and just just a, a quick aside, I was at a um, a workshop in I think in the late '80s up in Vermont. Met a painter from California. We were talking about limited palettes, and I had just read that one of the limited palettes Rembrandt used was yellow ochre, alizarin crimson, lamp black, and white. And I just mentioned that in passing because, you know, and we talked about how you can get a range of blues and greens with that limited palette of four colors, black, white, alizarin, crimson, and yellow ochre. The next day he went out and came back with a finished plein air painting of 16 by 20 using those four colors. And I was absolutely astonished. Yes, the colors are muted. Your greens are going to be muted. But, but because you're working with only four colors, the harmony was absolutely spectacular. And some of the most sophisticated neutral tones that that had subtle color notes in them it really was beautiful um, it's that, that you know I just always encourage people to experiment with limited palettes uh, it's it's so much fun to try those things and it takes a little time but it's it's definitely worth doing and uh, it is and don't get hung up on the results you're doing it for fun play literally play with it yeah. just see what kind of colors you can get don't get hung up on the results and then you might be surprised of at how what a beautiful painting you come up with so, John, before we wrap, I'd like to ask you, what are the common things that you find your students are doing wrong that you try to fix? Um, values, I, I, more than anything else. Uh, it's, it's the, the whole concept of a value structure, uh, having three to five basic sh large shapes of values in the painting and adhering to those values when you add color. It not only makes the values come alive, it makes the color come alive. Um, and, and I'm sometimes astonished at, at how even, even fairly, uh, you know, not beginners, people who are intermediate level painters will come in and, and, and say they've taken workshops and they've never been you know, taught anything about value, which I just find astonishing. So I would, I would say values. Boy, if you master values, mastering color is so much easier, or at least coming to a very proficient understanding of color. I think you're right about values. One of the things that would be great is if you could bring, since you're going to be painting a value study, a large value study on stage, maybe you could bring an example of what that finished painting might look like so they can see the end result once you've added the glaze and the color. I could, yes, I could certainly do that. And in fact, I could, I could even bring an underpainting that would be ready to be painted on, at least start to color, just to quickly show how I would start to add color. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good idea. All right, good. Well, terrific, John. Thank you for your time today. It's been a pleasure, and I'll see you in Santa Fe. Very good. See you soon. Take care. Well, thanks again to John McDonald. He's a fabulous painter, a good friend, and uh, really does a nice job as a teacher. Today's podcast was brought to you by the Plein Air Convention. Uh, it's in Santa Fe. Go to pleinairconvention.com. Also by the Plein Air Magazine, African Painting Safari, and you can learn more about that at African Painting safari.com the plein air movement is red hot which was why plein air magazine continues to reign at the newsstands number one at barnes noble in the art category and that's over photography and everything it's pretty cool so drop by pick one up or get a bi-monthly subscription for about half the price of the newsstand uh, at plein air magazine.com my name is eric rhodes this is a lot of fun let's do it again sometime i'm the publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Goodbye.